and good morning everyone and welcome to PerfWeb 84. Uh, I am day one, uh, lecture one and two. Uh, I'm your host, Joe Basha, and it's great that everybody's here with us today. Appreciate it so very much. Uh, as you know, you could be watching us on any of your social media platforms and listening to us on podcasts. But before we get started, let's get through our standard uh, opening that I need to do. And I'm just looking for that here. Usually I have that ready uh, before I get started. Yeah, there it is. To reach out to us, contact at perfusioneducation.com. And actually, the lecture, this first lecture today, the journal club that I'm doing, comes to us from a good friend of mine who uh, is who uh, from Cleveland Clinic who sent me an email uh, at contact at perfusioneducation.com and asked me to do a program on this very topic. So Amit, if you're watching, Amit Yarconi, uh, we are doing what you asked me to do uh, in that email. Our call-in number, uh, which will always stay live, 832-239. 5358. If you want to call, be live on the air. Amit would love to hear from you. Uh, take a look at our scroll bar. It has all of the information about our social media contact information and our call-in number as well. So it's always convenient for you to find those things. Uh, check out our MediWeb app. Uh, we've, uh, we're, we, I think we have some new updates that are uh, coming out here pretty soon, but it has perfusion quick calcs for doing your cases. It also has an ECMO section, hemodynamic section. Uh, it has an IV dose and rate calculator that's great for the clinical care environment. This is a very appropriate app for perfusionists, ECMO specialists, critical care nurses, critical care docs, pretty much anybody, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, anybody taking care of patients in the uh, critical care unit, whether they be ECMO or not, it doesn't really make any difference. You can also listen to us on your favorite uh, podcast uh, platform. You can look up our podcast on PerfWeb and you'll find our PerfWeb podcast series. So I think I got through all of that. Um, we're gonna jump right in to our journal club. And uh, of course, you know, we, we still miss Tammy. Tammy, if you're listening, we hope you'll come back and help us some more with these programs, uh, just in case. But uh, because I do think that you did such a great job with it and I'm doing my best to, uh, to fill in uh, for, uh, for her. Uh, with that said, uh, the topic today, as I said, I got from Amit up in Cleveland Clinic, and it's EVLP, ex vivo lung perfusion. W of course, what is it? You know, we all hear about tr transmedics device, that's the heart on a, in a box, uh, but you can also do lungs, and there's different techniques uh, that you can use these types of technologies for. So here is the article uh, from May of 2022 out of Cleveland Clinic that uh, is titled High Donor Lung Weight Likelier to Lead to Poor Transplant Outcomes. Um, and uh, I've got some comments about that, but let me move forward with this a little bit. But there you see uh, human lungs, you see some lines going to it, uh, one's colored green, one's colored yellow, uh, and it's in a, uh, in like a bubble, uh, if you will, uh, looks like, uh, uh, something is a humidifier. Here it is with it opened up. Uh, and the, uh, thing is, what is EVLP? So I think before we even get into this article talking about weight, and, and again, there's some very interesting points with that. I think it's best we look at a video and learn a little bit about what it actually is. Keep an organ outside the body uh, maintained in a way that we can um, measure it, we can assess it, we can allow it to recover of its own uh, natural recovery techniques, but also we can facilitate recovery of that organ or enhance its recovery. So really uh, perhaps allow us to make organs that are even superior to the way that we found them. The, the current uh, standard uh, by which we preserve organs for transplantation is to cool them. 
is so you slow down the process to death. However, if you slow everything down, yeah, you can see him looking at something there, a nodule or something that has his attention. Uh, it could be an injury, so it's really hard for me to tell. That strategy but he's feeling strategy something there. Is that in the ex vivo strategy, we keep the organ at normal body temperature. So cells can work, they can, they can begin to recover, they can heal, and we can facilitate regeneration. The way the system works is that we perfuse the lung outside the body, and the reason to perfuse it is to continue to provide nutrients, to remove waste products, to provide the oxygen and removal of carbon dioxide that the organs will need. We can also bronchoscope the lung, which means looking inside with a fiber optic scope. We can, we can diagnose infection, we can look at the anatomy of the lung, we can deliver different therapies and, and drugs into the lung through this technique. This uh, technique and, and this trial really heralds a, a new era in transplantation. Firstly, because we've changed the paradigm. We're not slowing down death, but we're beginning the recovery process even before the transplant starts. This uh, technique uh, will have a significant impact on the uh, organ donor pool. The most important thing is if you look at utilization of donor lungs worldwide, only 15% of donor lungs on average are used. The reason is that the other things, while they might be good, we can't be sure that they're good and safe to use. So the first major impact of the ex vivo system is some of those lungs that are good but we just can't tell, it will allow us to assess it. Ultimately, I think that having a lung that is better prepared for the transplant process will mean we'll have organs that will last longer and have our, our recipients live longer after transplantation. And that, uh, of course, that video coming from uh, the Toronto General Hospital up in uh, Canada. But there were some things in there that really caught my attention. And, and, and one of those in particular was that worldwide, on average, only about 15% of donor lungs are transplanted, are used. That is a remarkably low number uh, for an organ that is already in very low supply. And uh, certainly the second uh, part of today's lectures will kind of address it tangentially because with COVID, we had some major uh, problems with patients we thought would be great candidates for lung transplantation, but there was no way, uh, there were no organs, and uh, there was uh, uh, simply a, 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 an incredible um, overload of patients that needed lung transplantation surgery, very young patients who uh, could have gone on to live, but unfortunately did not, simply because we did not have the available uh, lungs to uh, to do that. So let's get into the article. Again, this is Cleveland Clinic's article, and it has to do with lung weight. And it's something that I think is uh, got a lot of relevance to a lot of different things. High donor lung weight predicts lower transplant suitability after ex vivo lung perfusion. Higher rates of primary graft dysfunction 72 hours after transplant and longer ICU and hospital stays compared with lower uh, donor lung weight. So concludes a new single center study of 365 human donor lungs that adjusted lung weights by donor height and correlated them with transplant outcomes. Very important concept to understand. Adjusted lung weights by donor height, okay? It was published online in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation by Cleveland Clinic researchers, where Amit is, uh, is from. The findings suggest that donor lung weight, an easily obtained and objective measure that correlates with the more difficult to estimate 
extravascular lung water is a good parameter for assessing transplant suitability and the need for EVLP. Consideration of donor lung weight can enhance decision making regarding the need for EVLP at the donor hospital as well as during EVLP evaluation, says the study's senior and corresponding author, Kenneth McCurry, surgical director of lung and heart transplantation at Cleveland Clinic. Our strategy, he says, for normalizing lung weight by donor height leads to better grading of extravascular lung water in donor lungs than simply using unstratified lung weight. And this is, again, I keep uh, 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 emphasizing that point about adjusted weight for patient height. Let's, let's get into this a little bit farther. A better way to gauge suitability for EVLP and transplant. Accumulation of extravascular lung water can occur in the donor before procurement and is exacerbated following ischemia reperfusion injury in the recipient after transplantation, leading to severe primary graft dysfunction and elevated mortality risk. Therefore, quantifying extravascular lung water in donor lungs prior to transplantation is an important consideration for whether the lung should undergo EVLP, a process that can facilitate water removal and improve lung function to make a lung more suitable for transplantation. However, measurement of extravascular lung water is limited with traditional assessment methods. The authors go on to say that no previous studies have examined the use of lung weight as a surrogate for extravascular lung water to predict suitability for transplantation. In a previous study published in the Journal of Surgical Research in 2021, Dr. McCurry's group found that among lungs rejected for transplantation, donor lung weight at procurement and change in lung weight during EVLP correlated with transplant suitability as assessed by standard EVLP parameters. The current study was designed to extend these findings to evaluate the effect of donor lung weight with clinical outcomes after transplantation. So I wanna stop here for just uh, one second and point out a couple of things. There's an abundance of research and uh, I was going to add it to this, but I chose not to. I think I'll just articulate it if I may but an abundance of research that patients who gain weight, water weight, in the ICU become edematous, third spaced, which can be for a whole variety of reasons, um, do poor, have poor outcomes. In fact, um, excessive weight gain from water retention in the critical care unit is an independent indicator of mortality. In fact, looking at albumin levels, which is a huge contributor to COP, uh, cholelanchotic pressure, which would result in third spacing of large amounts of plasma water into the uh, extra vascular space into the third space is also, so hypoproteinemia, hypoalbuminemia is also an independent indicator of mortality uh, in the uh, critically ill patients. So very interesting there. Study design and findings. Between the launch of Cleveland Clinic's clinical EV, oh, excuse me, EVLP program in February of 2016 and August 2020. So it's a relatively new technology. 
uh, started out in this, this particular study, the launch of their program in 2016, and they evaluated 365 human donors uh, for, uh, that were evaluated for transplantation and had available lung weight data. The outcomes of these lungs were retrospectively analyzed in this study, revealing the following. 239 of the 365 human donor lungs were transplanted without EVLP. 74 of those lungs, the 365, underwent EVLP with 50 of those being transplanted. Now, that is saying that only 75% of the lungs that underwent EVLP were transplanted. 25% of those lungs, or 20, since it was 50, 74 uh, total, that 74 that underwent it, 50 being transplanted, were discarded and not transplanted. That's a huge, no that's a huge number. Um, so of this, 24 lungs were essentially discarded. 52 lungs were declined for transplant without EVLP consideration. So, you know, I don't, I don't do lung transplantation surgery or perfusion for lung transplantation surgery cases would be more, more accurate. Uh, but I, uh, I found that very interesting and very telling, especially again, in lieu of the overwhelming shortage of suitable organs for transplantation and the sheer number of patients that are on a transplant list. Uh, there's a lot of people that die on a transplant list. I, I, you know, that is, a, that is a real problem. Whether human transplantation is really the answer or not, or if the answer is xenotransplantation, or if the answer is uh, some type of 3D printed, genetically engineered uh, organs, artificial organs. I, I don't really have that answer. Uh, and it's a very complex problem. But uh, clearly there's a, uh, a supply demand mismatch uh, that is profound. Lung weights measured at time of procurement at the donor hospital and after EVLP were adjusted by donor height and divided into four quartiles. The method of lung weight normalization is detailed in the article. We're not gonna get into that part of it. Initial lung weight was significantly correlated with donor height, and I'm gonna show you a, uh, a graph of that, but not with donor weight, body surface area, or body mass index, which again, does not surprise me at all. Uh, in the world we live in, we see a very tall patient and they, uh, that is a normal, somewhat normal body habitus and that's appropriate for their height. You open their chest up to expose their heart to do uh, regular bypass or, or valve surgery and you get into the, to the lung space for any reason. You open the pleura and you can see the lungs. They have much larger lungs. But when you take these patients who are short and squatty and fat, and you look at their lungs, they have teeny little lungs in this big giant barrel chest. So many, many times there was somebody that I used to work with, uh, Dr. Jones in Louisiana used to say it was a little person in a, or it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a, little person in a big person's body. So basically you have this big, big person. If they're short and squatty and grossly overweight, morbidly obese, their chest cavity is so small and their lung size is also very small, but you get these very tall, lean people and their lungs are much larger and much, therefore much heavier. And so they can't d just go by a lung weight uh, is what they're talking about in this article. They have to be able to adjust it for patient height. And here you see that 
You see down here the donor height in uh, centimeters, and here you see donor lung weight, and you see that as you get taller and taller, the weight of the organ goes up. All righty. Analysis of donor lung outcomes according to weight at procurement reveal the following notable findings. Nearly 90% of lungs in the three lowest weight quartiles were transplanted without need for EVLP. So adjusted lung weight the, and graded one two, and th one, two, three, and four of the lightest lungs adjusted for patient height, uh, they were able to be transplanted without using any ex vivo lung perfusion system. More than 40% of the lungs in the highest weight quartile underwent EVLP. After EVLP, 53% of lungs in the highest weight quartile were transplanted, compared with 61% to 100, 61% to 100% of lungs in the other three quartiles. So again, you take 53% that were actually used, 47% were discarded. So the more weight gain of the lung from what its adjusted weight should be, and that is for going to be from third spacing, other edema uh, 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 events, edema leading events of some sort, injury, whether it be reperfusion, or whatever the situation may be, um, or just the illness of the patient, uh, those lungs are far less suitable. So again, it goes right back full circle to weight gain in the ICU, third spacing of volume. And I contend this matters in cardiac surgery as well. In the very early days of cardiac surgery, we measured uh, COP. And it's a very easy thing to measure. In fact, if you, this is a real cheap plug, but if you get our app, it has COP on there so you can actually measure it uh, while you're doing your cases. But the use of albumin, when that went down, outcomes in my view uh, became worse. Uh, use of albumin improves outcomes. Liberal use of albumin, in my opinion, uh, and in my experience, uh, results in much better outcomes uh, and a much easier course, recovery course for the patient post cardiac surgery. Lungs in the highest quartile had a higher rate of primary graft dysfunction, grade three, at 72 hours, which was 19.3%, and were associated with longer ICU and hospital stays compared with lungs in the other lighter quartiles. Using lung weight for decision making. The authors conclude that the study provides strong evidence that adjusted donor lung weight corresponds with extravascular lung water and correlates with suitability for transplant in both straight transplant cases and EVLP cases. Whether measured at procurement or after EVLP, high adjusted lung weights were associated with worse clinical outcomes than lower lung weights, notes the study's first author, Toshihiro Akimoto, uh, Associate Director of Cleveland Clinic's EVLP program. The authors recommend the following strategy based on height adjusted lung weight at procurement. Standard lungs in the lowest three adjusted weight quartiles can proceed directly to transplantation. For standard lungs in the highest weight quartile, transplantation may proceed if the recipient is low risk. If the recipient is high risk, the lung should be assessed with EVLP first. For marginal lungs, EVLP is indicated regardless of lung weight 
and caution should be used when considering lungs in the highest weight quartile. Nearly 90% of lungs that underwent EVLP gained weight after EVLP by an average of 16% observed Dr. Akimoto. This result is consistent with reports on the effects of acellular EVLP. And we're gonna get into the, the preservation fluid or perfusion fluid, but you notice that point on the effects of acellular EVLP. The authors note that even though the heaviest lungs were the least likely to be transplantable after EVLP, there often is good reason to perfuse high weight lungs, especially considering the scarcity of transplantable lungs. So let's say you do 10 and one of them is good. You have to throw away 90. You were going to throw away 100. You were going to throw away 10 of them, but you kept uh, instead one. So you discarded nine. Given the scarcity of the uh, transplantable lungs, uh, that's a reasonable thing to do. Our study indicates that donor lung weight might contribute to better grading of extravascular lung water, making it useful for helping to determine whether lungs can go straight to transplantation or should undergo EVLP first, Dr. McCurry concludes. Further study of long-term outcomes is needed to more fully evaluate this strategy, which is obligatory and everybody says that. Uh, but you understand that e the study was designed to, to evaluate the grading process and to find what the adjusted lung weight is based on patient height. That's a very important aspect of this because if you just had a number and you weighed the lungs, not uh, in correlation to the patient's height and they exceeded a certain amount, you might think those lungs were not suitable. They were too heavy, too uh, full of water. Uh, so you might not use those. Whereas with the adjusted weight, you would say, this lung is a good lung. It needs to go directly to transplant uh, as, and, and may not even need EVLP first. So as you could imagine, one thing uh, will always lead to another. And I really needed to understand this. And if you remember the video from uh, Dr. Uh, Keshavji uh, up in Toronto, this article, Ex Vivo Lung Perfusion, uh, published in Operative Techniques in Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, uh, and its primary off, uh, 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 first author is uh, Marcelo Cipel. The number of patients listed for lung transplantation largely exceeds the number of available transplant organs because of both a shortage of organ donors and a low utilization rate of lungs from those donors. A novel strategy of donor lung management, ex vivo lung perfusion, EVLP, that keeps the organ at physiological protective conditions have shown a great promise to increase lung utilization by reevaluating, treating, and repairing donor lungs prior to transplantation. Clinical trials using EVLP has shown the method to be safe and allow for reassessment and improvement in function from high-risk donor lungs from both brain death and cardiac death donors, so prior to transplantation. So they are doing this technique even with, if you remember, we talked about this many times in this program, DCD, donation after cardiac death, right? Um, so it's not only from patients who are brain dead that you then go and harvest the organs, but patients where you have to do a standoff period and, uh, and uh, wait for uh, cardiac death with uh, the hypotension and hypoxia that occurs in those uh, circumstances. Preclinical studies have also shown a great potential of EVLP as a platform for the delivery of novel therapies to repair injured organs ex vivo, thus further improve lung transplantation outcomes. Herein, we describe detailed steps for a successful EVLP procedure. 
And this was very interesting. I'll show you some very interesting diagrams. Hey, guys. Um, indications. General indications for ex vivo lung perfusion are low oxygen uh, rates, PaO2, FiO2 ratio, or PF ratio, more commonly referred to, of less than 300 millimeters of mercury, signs of pulmonary edema on chest x-ray or during procurement at lung examination. Poor lung compliance at procurement, high risk clinical history, such as history for aspiration, pneumonia, or contralateral donor lung and controlled donors after cardiac death with a greater than 60 minutes between withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies and arrest. Some centers would perform EVLP routinely for donors after cardiac death. Now, very interesting, you know, when we look at our ECMO uh, population, a PF ratio of less than 300, we were putting patients on ECMO when their PF ratios were less than 70. So it'll give you some perspective about how sick the lungs were that we were dealing with that really needed uh, transplantation. Some recovered, and we'll talk about that in our next section uh, where I talk about our survival rate in those cases. Donor retrieval and procedure, uh, donor lung retrieval is performed as routine practice. Careful mobilization of the lungs is critical during the retrieval to avoid violation of visceral pleura and subsequent perfusate leaks during EVLP. The trachea is divided as proximally as possible, divided just below the larynx to facilitate secure intubation in the ex vivo system. Pulmonary artery, PA, and left atrium cuffs are left long enough whenever possible for ex vivo cannulation. And I'll show you these various diagrams, figures, drawings of this. When cuffs are too short, additional donor tissue, such as aorta, pericardium, or vena cava, can be used to construct neocuffs. Uh, the circuit is primed, this is interesting now, with two liters of Steen solution, uh, perfusion, and it comes from a uh, company, XVIVO, XVivo Perfusion Sweden. This solution is a buffered dextran containing extracellular type solution with an optimized colloid osmotic pressure developed specifically for EVLP. Sodium heparin, uh, 3,000 uh, international units, uh, and uh, imipenem, 500 milligrams, and methylprednisolone, uh, 500 milligrams are added to the perfusate. But the takeaway for me there, of course, you know, you've got the anti-inflammatory stuff, you got the anticoagulation stuff, you know, all of that's going on. Uh, but you have the, al uh, uh, the uh, colloidal osmotic pressure uh, increased because you don't want the volume of the third space, which we, which we talked about. So it's this special extracellular type solution, okay? After lung retrieval, but you can't have a collar on cotton pressure without, albumin, without some type of protein, or I guess you can have a synthetic protein. After lung retrieval, the uh, LA, the left atrial appendage is trimmed off and a, spe a specially designed funnel-shaped cannula, which I'll show you with a built-in pressure catheter ex from ex vivo perfusion is sewn to the uh, left atrial cuff with a 4-0 monofilament suture to create a closed circuit. And that's going to be your return, right? The splints, uh, this splints the left atrium open to create reliable and consistent outflow drainage. A specific PA cannula with a built-in pressure catheter is used for most cases where enough length of PA is available for cannulation, pulmonary artery. This cannula is secured with a zero silk uh, or with zero silk ties. Alternatively, the same funnel-shaped cannula used for the left atrium cannulation can be used for the pulmonary artery when the cuff is too short. Note that the silicone part of the cannula can be trimmed to fit the left atrium and pulmonary artery. Next, a back table uh, retrograde flush is then performed with a liter of Perfidex, which comes from ex vivo perfusion, under gravity drainage at 30 centimeters of water pressure. During this procedure, perfusate leaks from the left atrium and pulmonary artery uh, cannula anastomoses are checked and secured if necessary. Before transferring the lungs to the EVLP chamber, 
again from ex vivo perfusion. The trachea is clamped at the level of the carina to keep the lungs inflated. And subsequently, the proximal trachea is opened for intubation. An endotracheal tube, nine millimeter inner diameter, is inserted in the trachea and secured circumferentially with an umbilical tape or heavy silk tie. The lungs are transferred from the back table to the EVLP chamber, placed on a sterile operating room back table. First, the left atrial cannula is connected to the circuit and slow retrograde flow is initiated to de-air the pulmonary artery cannula. So it's done retrograde. Once the airing is complete, the pulmonary artery is connected to the circuit and retrograde flow is initiated at 150 milliliters per minute with the perfusate at room temperature. Now that's kind of an odd thing to me, room temperature. Well, what is room temperature? What if your operating room is, is 60 degrees? I guess that's what they do. At this stage, cannula position should be checked and especially a dent, gentle traction on the left atrial cannula is applied to assure good patency of pulmonary veins. It is also important to ensure that pulmonary artery and left atrial pressure readings are reliable to avoid hydrostatic damage of the lungs. So you do not want to have good inflow, bad outflow, uh, because that will create that hydrostatic uh, damage that they're referring to here. The temperature of the perfusate is then incrementally increased to 37 degrees over the next 30 minutes. When a temperature of 32 degrees is reached, usually over about 20 minutes, ventilation is started and the perfusate flow rate gradually increased to a target of 40% of predicted cardiac output, calculated from the size of the donor, uh, the lung donor. Then the flow of EVLP gas used to deoxygenate and provide carbon dioxide to the inflow perfusate via the gas exchange membrane is started at 0.5 liters per minute and titrated to maintain an inflow perfusate PCO2 of between 35 and 45. Recruitment maneuvers to a maximum of 25 centimeters of water pressure or 15 milliliters per kilogram, whichever is achieved first, are used to recruit regions of lung atelectasis. Lung overinflation should be avoided, understandably. So now let's look at some of these diagrams because I found them very interesting. Or drawings would be more appropriate. So here's the uh, here are the lungs, you know, the uh, right lung, the left lung. Here is the left atrium where the pulmonary veins return and drain usually from there, of course, into the left atrium, then going through the mitral valve and the left ventricle. Here is your pulmonary artery, so the right heart pumps. It goes through the PA, goes into the lungs, out of the lungs, through the pulmonary veins, back into the left left atrium. And of course, here is your trachea here, and you can see your carina where you break your branch off to your right and your left uh, lungs. Here is that cup they were talking about, which is sewn on the left atrium here. And you see the pulmonary veins, the four pulmonary veins, two from each lung coming into the left atrium there. And here you see that completed cuff that's sewn on the uh, left atrium uh, 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 tab that's left, and, um, and and here's your pressure, uh, your your internal pressure so, uh, measurement uh, line there. So very interesting, I think, uh, the way they do this. And then here, what you see is the pulmonary artery cannula that's going to be inserted into the main trunk of the pulmonary artery. Again, it goes. To there and then uh, goes to the uh, various different lungs. And here you see it with the uh, zero silk they talked about where the cannula is held in place in the main trunk of the pulmonary artery. And here again, you see this uh, pressure monitoring line that they have here. So during explantation, uh, what they do is they actually clamp the uh, 
trachea here just at the level of the carina to keep the lungs inflated and that's what they're demonstrating here here you see that clamp applied and now they are inserting the endotracheal tube into the uh, main uh, trachea and then sutured uh, or secured with uh, silk ties that you see there. Then it's placed in this uh, ex vivo compartment that's used, which appears to be a relatively rudimentary device. And I actually did not see a reason for it other than I would think that it was to maintain the humidity uh, of this environment so that the lungs uh, kind of like almost a, a, so I guess sort of like a greenhouse in some way so that you wouldn't dehydrate the, uh, or evaporate out um, your, uh, your uh, uh, tissue uh, water. Uh, but you see the endotracheal tube here, and here you can appreciate right there that little cuff. So this is going to be your drainage going to the uh, pump circuit system, and this is going to be your return going into the uh, pulmonary artery. And here is the complete circuit. Uh, in this particular one, and uh, the one we looked at from Toronto, they were actually using a roller pump, uh, and uh, which I'm assuming had a, a very good um, uh, pressure limiter on it. But you see the ventilator back here, uh, which is supplying the gas to the uh, lungs for perfusion. You have the drainage from the left atrial cuff, uh, that's going into a hard shell reservoir, out of the reservoir into the centrifugal pump, into the uh, membrane gas exchange uh, system. We're not gonna call it an oxygenator because that's not what they're doing. Into the leukocyte filter uh, in this particular model. Uh, and that's gonna be for uh, reduction of uh, inflammatory processes going back to the uh, uh, return line into the main pulmonary artery there. So very interesting. The maintenance phase of EHP, a long protective strategy of mechanical ventilation is used. Tidal volume of seven mLs per kilogram, positive index respiratory pressure PEEP of five, respiratory rate of seven and fraction of inspired oxygen at 21%. Recruitment maneuvers are performed every hour as a maintenance, uh, uh, every hour to uh, help prevent atelectasis. As a maintenance perfusate flow rate, we use 40% of estimated donor cardiac output to perfuse both lungs. Most of the lungs can be perfused at this flow rate while generally maintaining acceptably low PA pressures in the eight to 15 millimeter mercury range. For single lung EVLP, the proportion of 60% right and 40% left is used for perfusion flow and ventilation category, uh, uh, calculations. Left atrial pressure is maintained in the range of three to five millimeters of mercury. Left atrial pressure is controlled by adjusting the height of the reservoir. The height of the reservoir should be increased if collapse of left atrium or pulmonary veins is observed. These adjustments in reservoir height are needed more often during the flow ramp up phase in the first hour, likely because of fluid redistribution and uh, so forth. Generally, left atrial pressure stays stable after achieving full EVLP flows. Every one hour, we exchange 250 milliliters of the perfusate to maintain glucose levels and to provide fresh perfusate components. So this is a very interesting perfusate. I, I would have to do a whole separate program on what this perfusate is. Um, ex vivo lung functional evaluation. Lung function is evaluated every hour in the circuit. At 10 minutes before evaluation, the ventilation settings are switched to tidal volumes of 10 milliliters 
per kilogram, a rate of 10, and an FiO2 of 100%. The following parameters are then recorded. Oxygen function, uh, which is the uh, PF, uh, PaO2, FO2 ratio, delta PO2 equals PO2 perfusate, LA minus PO2 perfusate, PaPO2, and so forth. I'm not going to get into all that. Uh, general criteria for acceptability includes a minimum period of three hours of perfusion with stable or improved function parameters and a delta PO2 of greater than 350 millimeters of mercury. Alternately, or alternatively, a criteria of an left atrial PO2 of greater than 400 can be used. Eventually, unilateral lung injury can account for functional deterioration during EVLP in that case. Careful, uh, careful assessment with pulmonary vein gases, lung x-ray, and flexible bronchoscopy can determine whether the contralateral lung can be salvaged for single lung transplantation. So you can have one lung go bad. And what's so interesting about this is you can image the lung, you can and look at its vasculature, you can do a bronch and actually look in there for any kind of um, uh, secretions uh, or uh, maybe fluid accumulation. It's very interesting that what they can do with these things, these lungs sitting in that uh, uh, little plastic bubble container. After the final ex vivo evaluation, the lung block is cooled down to the, uh, to, in the circuit to 10 degrees. Thereafter, perfusion and ventilation are stopped FiO2 is increased to 50% for lung storage and the trachea clamp to maintain the lungs in an inflated state. The lungs are then flushed with 500 milliliters of fresh cold steam solution. Some centers use Perfidex instead and then stored at four degrees in Perfidex until transplantation in a standard sterile organ bag surrounded by ice. This phase is called the second cold ischemic time. The components of the EVLP system are detailed and we went through that. The perfusate is circulated by a centrifugal pump passing through a membrane gas exchanger and a leukocyte depletion filter before entering the lung block through the pulmonary artery. A filtered gas line for the gas exchange membrane is connected to an H-sized tank with a, uh, a specialty gas mixture of 6% oxygen, 8% carbon dioxide, and 86% nitrogen. And it comes from Prax Air in Ontario, Canada. A heat exchanger is connected to the membrane gas exchanger to maintain the perfusate temperature. P uh, pulmonary artery flow is controlled by the centrifugal pump and measured using electromagnetic flow meter. The outflow perfusate returns through the left atrium cannula to a hard shell reservoir, lungs are ventilated with a standard intensive care unit type ventilator, and the lungs are contained in a specifically designed lung enclosure that comes from ex vivo perfusion. Okay, it looked like a plastic bubble to me. And there's your references to this article. Now, there's even more people, of course, that have an interest in this, an ex vivo lung perfusion, a key tool for translational science in the lungs, uh, written by Tain and colleagues and published in Chest. So when they look at, and there it is in the center that you can see, the ex vivo or EVLP technique, the article, and this is really what I want to look at, is uh, uh, has this uh, diagram discussing pros and cons. In the pro section, evaluation of lungs under continuous physiological monitoring is a benefit. Reconditioning the lungs with fluid removal is a benefit. Intervention engineering of lungs with intense therapy is a benefit. So you can do things to these lungs to help make them better. Extended preservation time 
of course, would be a benefit because normally you just take them, you put them on ice, you put them in a bag, you put them on ice, and you take them to the place that they're going to be transplanted. So pretty much cold static storage, like we do with hearts, you do with lungs. The cons is induced inflammatory pro uh, processes. Does not surprise me. Uh, it's an extracorporeal circuit. You're doing strange things to the lung. There's, and that's of course why they're using the leukocyte depleting filter and the methylprednisolone. Com compromised cellular metabolism and mitochondrial function does occur. Disrupted microcirculation does occur and ventilator induced lung injury does occur. So there is this balance. It's not a perfect system. It's an imperfect system. And you can see in this uh, article that they made the pros heavier than the cons. So there is benefit, but the benefit as we understand is incremental. But when you're talking about lung transplant surgery, again, based on the scarcity of the organs available and the ability to overcome the cons, perhaps more so uh, that the pros outweigh the cons by far, the therapy is likely going to continue. And here we see uh, the uh, lungs. You can see here the pulmonary artery cannula that's perfusing the lung. Here is the pulmonary vein cannula attached to the left atrium, which is draining the lung. Here is your, and your tracheal tube here. Here is someone who is uh, doing a bronchoscopy of these lungs, and he can see his monitor here uh, for evaluation purposes. So one of the questions that I have is, because I've, I, I don't know the answer. If somebody knows, I'll meet if you're watching or if you watch it later and you want to make a comment in our uh, videos uh, on any of the platforms, wherever you may watch it from, would be very helpful. But who watches this? Who's doing, is this a preservationist? Is it a perfusionist? Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, I think there's, you know, I've said many, many times, there's a lot of exciting new stuff that is coming out that is going to per perhaps fundamentally change perfusion. I don't know, perfusion, perfusion really, it's changed, what we use has changed, but perfusion really hasn't changed in the 40 plus years that I've been involved in this industry. Um, but I think that the technology that exists now is so incredible. And the number of various things that we can be doing and being a part of uh, is changing and morphing and right before my eyes. This, uh, I had never seen this before. I talked to Matt Warhoover up at Vanderbilt and he talks about doing DCD and reanimation and bringing uh, and using the transmedics and all of that. I remember hearing about this idea of transporting uh, uh, hearts in a box, like in 1988, 89 in that area. Um, but now they're actually doing it. I thought it was crazy then, um, but now look at what they're able to do. It's just so incredible at where we've come, but who's watching it? Is it perfusionists? Is it, is it preservationists? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. And, you know, when I go back to the early, early days of perfusion, it was just like, hey, you, I need to teach you how to work this pump. And uh, you look, you're, you're a, a hardworking guy. You seem pretty smart, like you a lot. And here, sit here. We're going to teach you how to do this. And uh, perfusion was born from that. Um, are we going to go back to that? You know, I, I don't know. I, it's very interesting. It's It has me probably has again like almost every program i do i always have more questions than i have answers for anything but with that said uh that's evlp ex vivo lung perfusion there is a uh, a whole company that that is uh, what they do and they're selling the preservation fluid again i, I think it's very interesting at their gas uh, that they use a lot of interesting things and just not enough time to go over it all. But hopefully it will stimulate your interest to want to look more, uh, up more about it. But I think as a group, as a, 
as an organization, we probably should be looking at this and saying, who is running those circuits? And, uh, you know, I mean, should they be? Should it only be perfusion? Of course, I don't know. Uh, again, Amit, if you could help us out with this, I'd appreciate it very much. Okay, I'm going to take a short break, come back, do part two of today's program, and uh, which is going to be our data. I'm going to look at some other data, but our data on survival during the COVID pandemic from what we saw in six hospitals, uh, which is what our area of involvement uh, was. And uh, going to talk a lot about, you know, what we saw, but also compare it to what other people have published that they saw. Um, so it should be very interesting, I think. At least, certainly, it's thought-provoking for me. So if you can give me five minutes or so, I'll be right back.
Okay, and welcome back. Let's go ahead and get started on uh, day two. D are the slides the way you need them, David? You need to make them, uh, oh, I thought I did. Well, oh. Yeah. oh, shit. Shoot. Sorry. Okay, perfect. All right, so for us, the, um, the pandemic started uh, in March of 2020, and that's the, uh, down here in the, in the Houston, greater Houston area. The very first patient that was seen in the greater Houston metropolitan area uh, we saw at one of our uh, partner facilities. And um, the pandemic ran through December uh, of 2021. And actually, it kind of just fell into a couple of days of 2022. But the uh, initiation, the patient uh, for us was admitted for uh, ECMO evaluation uh, uh, or referred for ECMO evaluation and initiation in December of uh, 2021. So uh, that's, that's how the uh, dates run. And this is in six Houston area hospitals. Uh, two of those hospitals had the overwhelming majority of our ECMO patients. Um, not to say that others didn't have COVID and COVID patients, um, uh, but they, because they, because they did, we were all overrun. I mean, our intensive care unit had, uh, in one of our hospitals had 28 beds and 27 of those beds, uh, were, uh, were COVID patients. Um, and, uh, of those 27 beds with, uh, with COVID patients, uh, the one bed that wasn't COVID was a heart, um, and, uh, that we were, that we did. And, um, uh, of that six of those 27 COVID patients were on ECMO. And this is at a place that had only, uh, one uh, in-house ECMO pump. So we started off by using one of our heart lung machines and then got more ECMO pumps. And, uh, we were scrambling to find them, bringing them out of retirement, essentially, uh, equipment that had been decommissioned because we just had no choice. Um, uh, it was that or, uh, or, or don't offer, uh, uh, the opportunity for the patient to potentially survive. And again, these were young people. Our COVID population was very young, uh, certainly too young to be, uh, be dying prematurely from a respiratory virus. Uh, and uh, th I think that, I think there's a lot of people and I'm of that group that still has uh, still suffers from PTSD from that time frame. Uh, it was just so incredibly surreal and, uh, and, and busy. And you just had no time to actually think or do anything or consider your own life. It was very, 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 uh, unnatural the way we were working and what we were dealing with and the level of death that we saw was, uh, was, uh, uh, unbelievable anyway. Uh, so two of the hospitals were like that. One of the hospitals larger, um, had a more streamlined, uh, transfer, uh, program in place with their, uh, medical center hospital. And I'm going to avoid today mentioning names of any hospitals people that want to look it up can probably figure it all out and that's up to you if that's what you choose to do um but i, I this isn't about any hospital this is about just what I, we experienced we experienced as a group in this part of the country uh in comparison to others uh which 
and I have some provocative uh, uh, data on that, and and, and I have some uh, some very uh, uh, unanswered questions actually that uh, I think I'd like to get to, and we can all maybe figure this out together. Uh, and then three of the hospitals were uh, smaller facilities uh, that historically would do much much less ECMO compared to the other three, which are larger. Here is our first ECMO patient, uh, Chris Hernandez. He was a lieutenant with the Patton Village uh, Police Department, which is up in the northern Houston area up towards Conroe, uh, Texas. Uh, he was actually admitted, I believe, on the 8th of March. He is who shut the, he was patient zero. He is Houston's patient zero. He shut the rodeo or this particular uh, infection that was identified. Uh, it wasn't him personally that shut it down, but this case resulted in the rodeo being shut down, uh, which is unprecedented in history for that. Uh, he was put on ECMO on March 12th. His ECMO was discontinued successfully March 25th. And there you see him being discharged from the uh, hospital. This article was written uh, from a, uh, a writer with the uh, Houston Chronicle. What are our raw numbers? Between March 20th, uh, March of 2020, I'm sorry, and December 30th of 2021, we had a total of 117 ECMO patients. 87 or 74.3% of those ECMOs were for COVID during that time frame. In 2020, uh, so going back uh, uh, prior to, we had a total of 49, I'm sorry, my, my, my mistake, further divided, my mistake, I'm sorry, further divided from March of 2020 to December of 2020, so the, the year 2020, we had a total of 49 ECMOs, 77.5% of them, or 38, were for COVID and in 2021, which is an entire, was an entire year, as opposed to a partial year for 2020, we had 68 total ECMOs with 48 of them or 70% of those being COVID. Now, remarkably, it's important to note that in 2021 was really Delta and or towards the end of 2020, early 2021. And it was very, very, our survival uh, at the time was, was horrifying. Uh, but when I really looked at the numbers and the data, I was like, well, was Delta really that bad? I, it's hard for me to say. We'll see. Let's look at the numbers and we'll all, we'll, we'll all see. Between March of 2020 and December 30, 2021, we had, a set, again, 87 COVID ECMOs, 19 total survived. So 21.8% of our COVID ECMOs in our group that we cover in six different hospitals survived, went on to go home and have a normal existence. I don't mean just come off ECMO, off ECMO, discharged to home. In 2020, so March through December of 2020, we had 38 uh, COVID ECMOs, eight of those patients survived, or 21%. And in 2021, again, looking at Delta, 48 COVID ECMOs with 11 of those patients surviving, so 20, almost 23%. So there really wasn't a significant difference between the original strain of COVID and maybe the first, uh, uh, first uh, 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 variant, but then it, with what we knew was the Delta variant, 
I don't know that I saw, you know, when you look at the numbers that we have, it doesn't appear that it was necessarily more deadly or we have not granulated this data enough to tease out that perhaps we just weren't putting uh, patients or those patients on ECMO. I, I don't really know. Survival by facility. So we're going to have just numbers for the names of the facility, one through six. We had four in one faci facility, one, four total ECMO patients. None of them survived. That's during the entire time from March uh, 2020 to December of uh, 2021. Facility one, four ECMOs uh, for COVID, zero survivors. Uh, facility number two, we had one uh, ECMO and we had 100% survival. Facility three, six total, 0% survival. So the facility was only one. Uh, that patient was transferred, by the way, and uh, they, uh, they uh, uh, did very well, as a matter of fact. But they had one COVID ECMO and it was transferred with 100% survival. So that's kind of skews the numbers a little bit. In another facility four, they had four total ECMOs with 25% survival. So one of those four survived. Facility five, we had 40 ECMOs with a 28% survival. Facility six, 47 total ECMOs and 20% survival. So you can see that five and six are those facilities where ECMO seemed to be uh, the direct, something we were going to do somewhat routinely. And if you could excuse me for just one second. Hey, Steve, how are you? I'm going to probably need about uh, 10 minutes. You want to grab a cup of coffee? Yeah, if you'd like to. Um, or you could stay here if you prefer, but you can get coffee and come back too. Um, in this article that was published just recently, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation for COVID-19, a collaborative experience from the Texas Medical Center, TMC in Houston, with two-year follow-up with our uh, primary uh, authors being Bindu, uh, Dr. Suarez, uh, uh, Dr. Aconte and Dr. Suarez, Dr. O'Neill, Raleigh, a, a whole variety of people, uh, Dr. McGilvery, a lot of people whom I know, Dr. Gregoric uh, from... Uh, uh, from uh, mem uh, Memorial, from the uh, uh, heart failure group, uh, Dr. Uh, Masood, uh, just a, 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 a who's who of, uh, of, uh, of cardiac and intensive care and cardiology medicine here um, and uh, transplant. So in their study, March 1st, 2020 to May 30th of 2020. So March, April, May, three months. And the Texas Medical Center, for those of you who may not know this, it is the largest medical center in the world. Uh, they have their own government. government. Uh, pretty impressive uh, place. But they did, in that short time frame, three months, 35 patients that they evaluated compared to ours, and I have mine in, uh, in, in red, over that almost two years, 87. So theirs is in three months, 35 patients. And I just want to go right to the point of all of this. I don't want to look through all of this stuff. The number of days that they had patients on ECMO, their median was eight. Ours was a median of 30 between 11 and 83 days. Here's their ECMO uh, duration in days was between 13 plus or minus 11. So it could be two days, could be 26 days. Um, our median was 30. Uh, for the, and that's for their survivors. For their non-survivors, they were 24 plus or minus 13. So a little longer, um, but that would be about uh, 11 days to uh, uh, all the way up to uh, 37, 38 days. Um, our median was 27.9 days for our non-survivors, 12 days to 65 days. Very interesting to me 
is that their overall survival was 66% of those who went home at one year and at two years that only dropped down to 63%, which is absolutely incredible uh, numbers. Now, why? Why were, was our survival 20%, their survival 63%? And I really had to try and understand this. It really bothered me quite a bit. And one of the things that falls into this patient demographic is transplants. So what's not on here is that a significant number of these patients that were evaluated includes patients who were on ECMO, had lung transplant, and then went on to go home. That's going to make these numbers look much, much, much larger. We did not have that option. And I'll tell everyone something else too. And let me tell you, I think the Texas Medical Center is a phenomenal place. Uh, if you've never been there, even if you're not in medicine, you cannot help but be impressed. Uh, there are incredible museums there, the things that you can see and the, just the sheer size of the place. And when you walk into, whether it be Memorial or Methodist or St. Luke's, and you go into those facilities and you consider what has happened there um, over the past 70 years, 60 years, is just phenomenal um, and uh, very impressive. And they do incredibly good work and they're extremely uh, 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 competent and, uh, and uh, uh, they're excellent researchers with high degree of credibility. So these numbers are accurate, but it's, we sat and we had these patients and it was very, very, very difficult for us to get a patient transferred to the Texas Medical Center. And therein lies the problem. They can only handle, no matter how big they are, no matter how great they are, they can only handle so much. They can only do so many cases. There's no way they can do um, uh, every case. So evaluation for lung transplant required that the patient be able to participate in their recovery, which meant we had to get the patients that we had never done this for before up and walking a minimum of 100 feet for consideration to go on the transplant list. But we learned a lot from that because we found that when we were able to do that, if we could do that with the patient, a lot of times they would get better and they would not need a transplant and we could actually get them weaned from ECMO. But the bottom line here is that there's not enough organs. So we have all of these patients, a massive amount, that need to get an organ, but they can't. Whether it be a Texas Medical Center, we looked in other states, we tried getting patients anywhere that we could get them taken care of, but it was not going to happen. The entire system was so overwhelmed with patients, it was never going to happen. So you are either gonna get better, because let me tell everyone, ECMO is not without its consequences. You put patients on ECMO, you, you, there are a whole bunch of things that can happen, tremendous resource utilization, and there are negative consequences to being on ECMO. If you take a very healthy, normal person and put them on ECMO, it is not good for you. Now, it can help you if you need a bridge, in this case, we'll say lung, but uh, uh, which is what it was, 
but it has other deleterious effects on coagulation and uh, stroke risk and all uh, inflammatory processes and <clears throat> and and uh, uh, renal dysfunction, it, it, intracranial hemorrhage. I can't tell you how many patients we had that were improving, walking, doing well, and the next day their neurostatus changed dramatically. Took them to CT, massive intracranial bleed, and they would die. So a lot of consequences to uh, to ECMO. But again, I think that. You have to look at all of these studies with some degree of skepticism and say, okay, our numbers were far worse. Again, our survival was in the low 20s. Their survival was in the 60%, but we don't have transplant capability. They do. And I'm going to end a little early. I know I'm ending early, but tomorrow we're going to go long. So I'll make up for it in case the board is monitoring me. And uh, thank you all very much. I'll see you tomorrow.